Hi, so uh, welcome back to some of you and welcome uh, for the first time to, uh, to you who are joining us for the first time. I am Michael Chauvin Dalton, the director of the gallery at uh, James Kearney Center. So the JKC gallery is really what I meant to say. And uh, uh, this is Third Thursdays, our monthly artist talk. Uh, so I want to just, uh, for those of you who may not know, one of our hosts tonight, Heather Palasek, has a show that is up and running at the JKC gallery. And I bet there's quite a few here who attended the reception and uh, loved it as much as uh, we all did. Uh, that is recorded and on the jkcgallery.online site. Uh, you can watch that, but the show is still up and we do have limited hours. <clears throat> Excuse me. Unfortunately, this Monday we have to shut down for some maintenance work, but we'll be open Monday the 29th uh, from 10 to 1. Yes, that's right. 10 to 1. <laughs> Just um, uh, contact me. You can contact me. Uh, uh, you know what? Visit the jkcgallery.online site. That's easier. And contact me there. Um, and I will tell you how you can come and when you can come so we're not all um, coming together. Uh, but that show is amazing. And it's up. And it's up till April 1st. So the 29th will be the, the last in-person visit that we have. Uh, and uh, so, yes. So welcome again. And we're going to get started with our two wonderful guests. And I'm going to hand it over to uh, Heather Palasek and Habib Suwab. Welcome, welcome everyone. I see some familiar faces in the group chat and I also see some unfamiliar faces. I just wanna welcome everybody on behalf of me and Michael and JKC Gallery. This is the third Thursdays. Round of applause, hold your applause, hold it, okay? All right. So I'm excited. We have two amazing guests. I just want to give you a little back history about Third Thursdays. Me and Heather came up with the awesome idea that all oh, that Third Thursdays of the month, we should showcase local artists that's in the Trent area. And of course, with the pandemic, now we have a global audience. So cheers on that. All right. Mm -hmm. I'm going to pass it off to Heather. She's going to introduce the next the guest that we have this month. Take it away. Thank you, Habib. Um, so tonight our two guests are, our two featured photographers are Bridget Laudine and Preston Riskigno. Um, Bridget will be sharing with us her long-term project about post-traumatic growth. Um, she uses digital photography as a medium to explore the histories held in and told by people's bodies, including her own. Um, and Preston's work explores how the avalanche of digital images we're exposed to every single day has affected like a paradigm shift um, in us and how we think about photography um, and how it has personally affected his own work and how our digital culture creates an ecosystem of visibility for photographers. So we have two um, totally different subject matters and styles of photography to present with you today. Um, Preston is going to be going first, followed by Bridget. Um, we're so excited to see your work. So thank you two for being here um, and sharing with us tonight. Preston, do you think you're ready to start your presentation? I think I'm ready. All right. I think I'm ready. Everybody, thanks for coming. Uh, and um, uh, Heather and, Ab and Habib, thank you so much for, uh, for inviting me. Um, and Michael, thank you um, for uh, facilitating this, even though I'm a little uh, disappointed that you're not in your, um, in your robot status. Um, so I start with I'm going to be like bopping around here a bit with some with some um, uh, with some ideas that I've been that I've been rolling around my head for for the uh, for the for the for the past couple of years. Um, so um, in 2015, Benedict Evans, um, this data analyst, uh, extrapolated that there were more pictures made in that one year uh, that had been made in the whole history of analog photography. And even if he was off by a couple of years, like if, you know, like it, it's really like five years of digital photography equals um, all of analog photography. It's still, it's still pretty immense. Um, you know, photography has become the lifeblood of our, of our culture. Um, you know, I have, I have access to over like 30,000 images on a small computer that I carry around in my pocket. Uh, we often look at hundreds of pictures a day just on social media. In my work, I'm most interested in how this avalanche of images, uh, especially now in, in a time of pandemic, political and social justice reckoning has affected this paradigm shift and how we think about photographer, or photography and the way this affects 
the way I make my work and how digital culture creates an ecosystem of visibility. It's a, it's a phrase I, I stole from these uh, two Italian guys who wrote this, this, uh, this, uh, this paper that I'll, I'll, I'll credit uh, later on in the talk. Um, I think we fundamentally have to reconsider how we think about photography. Uh, the definitions of, of, of art in, in our digital age um, has been murky at best. Uh, with, with titles such as post-internet, post-medium, post-digital, and post-post photography. Um, I opt for something that's a little more um, 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 homegrown. Uh, it, it, was, it was actually uh, came out of a conversation I had with, uh, with, uh, with two of my friends, um, Anibal Pella uh, Wu and, uh, and, uh, and, and, and Laura Sellers, um, even though she cringes every time I, I bring this up. Um, so uh, the phrase is, uh, we, we were talking about uh, the plethora of images that, that we all have access to and, and how you know, we can find a picture of anything on the internet. Um, you know, we, in, in, in the virtual fire hose of images we're, we're assaulted with um, every day. And, and she very excited, excitedly said, uh, said uh, I once saw a picture of a monkey in space. Um, I thought it, and I thought it was the perfect way to contextualize uh, this era of photography. Um, photography, hands down, is the most important visual medium in this in this moment. It holds a powerful place in this world, and we must begin to align ourselves with that fact and begin to learn how how to think about it accordingly. Uh, we're again to reassess what gets to be defined as a photograph. Uh, there's a phrase I use: the tyranny of the good picture. It describes what gets considered a good picture. And it's usually an aesthetically pristine and well put together frame that seems to permeate much of what's considered good photography. It's defined almost entirely by, by a Eurocentric canon, traditionally by white male gatekeepers. It's in opposition to the way that we visually live now in an aesthetically, in an aesthetically unregulated plane where images from our cousin's Facebook feed has equal relevance to anything, anything all of us trained photographers make, especially once it gets out in the world. All can be equally relevant in the deluge of, of images that we that we encounter. So it's time to blow up and consider realign this canon, one that's created mostly for white males by white males, and seek out those who have been overlooked as the other and create a space to equalize the, this work and wash away the notion of the canon. And Walter Benjamin's uh, Art in the Age of Mechanical Re Reproduction, which was written in, in, the, in the 30s, uh, he had this idea that. Uh, there was an aura to the original and that the full mechanical reproduction um, when it was translated to this non-original non object loses this aura. Benjamin's head, uh, Benjamin's head certainly would have been exploding if he had been a, a, encountered on the digital world. There was no such thing where there was no such thing as the original. Uh, NFT files not, notwithstanding, uh, NFT files are a blockchain endorsed authentic copy, which we seem to have to contend with now. It, but it just seems to be like folks are, 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 are trying to absurdly create uh, artificial scarcity. Uh, there is a passage in Carl Ove Kosengard's My Struggle, book one, that describes uh, a study on the effects of pictures um, of things on our memory. It states that more than likely, if someone mentions something like the Eiffel Tower, your brain tends to more often pull a picture up, even if you have even if you're experienced um, that object um, yourself by standing in front of it. Um, there's, there's one scene in grad school uh, that tends to play over my head, uh, head often. It was, uh, it was the late 90s and uh, I was sitting in the newly minted uh, computer lab uh, and I just switched over from analog photography into digital. Um, I was going on about how beautiful the pictures looked on the screen uh, behind me were standing uh, a group of mostly uh, uh, 1980s uh, um, 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 uh, painters and, and one of them who I will uh, not name um, just kind of looked at me and, and said, uh, who, who's gonna wanna look at a picture on a screen? Uh, I kind of think I won that argument in the end. Uh, we have to depart from the idea that the room or book full of photographs in, is the end game. The age of the object is slipping away. We like to think photographs 
the photographs we make are important, but we are up against a torrential rain of images day after day after day ad infinitum. We attend and show images in forums such as this. We make books, exhibits, have websites, post on social media, et cetera, to prove the exceptionalism of our images, to try and prove that the revelance against this ocean of, ocean of, against this ocean of images. But in the end, up against all that is being made, there is nothing left to prove. The good news is how freeing this all is. We make, we give to the world, and we create a continuous opportunity to begin again, something sometimes almost instantaneously. There has, has traditionally been an overarching need to rise above this white noise. It's my contention that we must be part of that white noise, to understand that we are part of the flow. The image world has made individual images less, less relevant. It is flattening the hierarchies and making the gatekeepers irrelevant. More and more equal, more is more, more equals a cohabitated relevance. relevance. Joining the flow, we need to create this ecosystem of, of visibility for our work. The single photographic masterpiece has, has become artifice. All art in this, con in, in this context, photography, is produced now and inherently falls under the realm of post-internet meaning. Everything is in influenced somehow by the networks we live in. Obviously, this includes forms of digital imaging, but also is extended to the analog sectors of photography. There is an instance where, where the internet or the networks have not in some way influenced our photographic image making or understanding. Um, I've been thinking a lot about, about Heather's uh, show at, at, at the JKC gallery that's, that's hanging now. Um, one instance of this show is, is the physical analog images that are hung in the white box. And the lead up and during and after, there were a number of different ways you could experience, you could, you, you could experience on this show. Uh, there were posting images from and invitations to the show online. There was a VR gallery that was created where you could access a virtual show via a 3D generated website. Her IG story showing, showing her process, the physical and social distance opening reception and the amazing virtual reception and gallery talk. We got to see Michael Dalton as a robot, the reusable shopping bags sold with, 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 with some of the images and an archival video of, of, that, of that same um, gallery talk. I'm sure this time I've, I've forgotten. You all become the same different instance of, of the thing, the visual ecosystem. The content, for lack of a better word, ex exists in multiple instances at the same time and continues. The hierarchy of the traditional gallery show has been flattened and, and subverted in a quite wonderful way. Because of all of these instances, none is more inherently rel relevant than the other. It all depends on the experiential aspect of the viewer. The analogness of the original has been made less relevant by its digital copies. I don't need to go to a gallery to experience the pictures. The show has itself has, has different instantations. Although I loathe to bring up um, Michael Foucault, uh, the philosopher, sorry, the philosopher, because I swore if I heard that name one more time after grad school, I was going to puke. Um, he describes a, a, co a concept called heterotopia. It's a certain cultural institution or, dis or discursive space that, that is somehow the other. It's disturbing, it's intense, compatible, contradictory, and or transforming. Heterotopias are worlds within worlds, mirroring and yet upsetting what is outside. The network we all live inside is now part of, of image making, the sharing and the processes. A photograph is, has a hard time existing without the network, and it doesn't, ma it doesn't matter which way it was made. Okay, now I'm going to end the, the wonky part of this, of this presentation. Uh, we do need to contend with the evil of these networks, mostly existing to profit off our data and our digital footprint. Uh, James Bridle, uh, the, who, who I reference again later, um, describes it as being part of the machine. The increasing amount of information is overwhelming and our understanding of the world, he warns, it's is pushing us all to the fringes. We have to think about what it means. VR, AI, machine learning, deep fakes, uh, Bridal says, are, are developing tools that can create a much more convincing reality, making it harder to, de to determine what is reality. It's essential that we quickly develop skills to understand this new reality. 
We need a different way of thinking about the world and we need it soon. Uh, now I'm gonna actually talk about the, uh, the work itself. I've looked at photographers such as Wolfgang Tillmans, um, whose work uh, begins to question what gets to be a photograph. Uh, there's a, a piece that he, he did that was up at the Met um, um, about five or six years ago. It was, it was called the, uh, the Book for Architects. Um, it, it isn't a book. It's, it's 450 images on four panels projected on two walls that changed disjointedly. You're constantly making decisions where to look and what, and what, and what images to look at before they disappeared. Um, Otto Gillen had a piece up at, uh, during the Whitney Biennial in 2017. Um, it was 90 minutes of, of pictures projected on a wall at the end of a narrow room. You could watch the whole thing or slip in and out at various times, but you could still pull threads of the various themes he was trying to get at, no matter how long you were there. Embarrassingly, I've only started to understand the work of performance artist Pope L, multi-talented artist David Hammonds, Fred Wilson's monumental work, uh, Mining Their Museum, now, though I knew of Lawrence Simpson from living through the 80s, I learned a great deal more about her when I did some research before I gave a presentation to my, to my then marketing VP about photography. And lately, uh, the incredible work of Zora Murph. What I'm trying to do in this work is harness, is harness the multiple, to form a path of meeting non-meeting from the more. I've been up here in Massachusetts since October 24th. Um, to help mom out with some, with some things. And I, and I ended up staying. For the first time in years, I've been photographing every day and creating a flow of images that can be accessed and updated regularly on social platforms, my website, and a tumble of images in this talk. I've stripped back to everything, the images, the image making device, the aesthetics, deconstructing what gets to be a photograph, the process. I've been, I've been just seeing what flows around me. It's my mom first and foremost, Everything else just swirls about that, about that. In this pandemic, I walked the two square miles around this house. I venture out to the grocery store. I stand in backyards of relatives. COVID has determined a lot, just about everything. It's a big reason why I'm still here in March. I've stopped trying to convince my mother that it's not the burden she thinks it is. It's been critical for me to be up here and, to, and I get to make pictures. Personally and photographically it has been a grand jury journey. I'll end the talk with, uh, with describing uh, three songs that, um, that make me cry every time I hear them. Uh, it used to only be two of them, but uh, one added me uh, um, in March of last year. Uh, the first one is Danny Boy, uh, usually the Johnny Cash version, but I've, uh, I've totally been known to get uh, misty-eyed when the uh, Kearney, New Jersey uh, marching band, high school marching band plays it during the St. Patrick's Day Parade. Um, it's, it's a song about a, a father who sends his son off to find his, uh, his way in the world, knowing full well that he'll probably never see him again. Uh, that is until he feels him standing on his grave. Uh, it made me weep when I, when I didn't have a son, but, but, but after that, like, you know, it's, it's, just, it's just off the charts. Um, the second song, and it's, it's a little, uh, um, a little goofier, but it's, it's, a, it's, it's a song by Warren Zevon, uh, the great uh, LA uh, singer songwriter. Um, it's the hockey song. It's like this dopey song about a, a Canadian hockey player who gains his dream of playing professional hockey, but alas, only as a goon. And in, in, in hockey parlance, a, a, a goon is somebody who is sent out onto the ice just to beat people up. He has one dream, which is just to score a goal before his career ends. And I won't give away the little, the luscious ending. Uh, I stumbled, I internet stumbled over the trapeze singer uh, last March. It's a uh, iron and wine song uh, and it's covered by Gregory Allen As um, Asimov, uh, Isaacoff, sorry. Um, I've only been able to find it um, on YouTube. So if you look up um, iron uh, trapeze singer on, on YouTube, uh, his, his version comes up. Uh, Iron, Iron Wine does a good enough version of it, but, but Isaacoff brings it to like this next level. That's, that's just incredible. Um, it uses these amazing free association lyrics uh, that, are just, that are just a heartbreak and it, and it freaking kills me every time. Uh, 
um, it's 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 become kind of my my pandemic song. Um, I just want to credit um, the three sources that helped me that helped focus me in this talk. Uh, one is uh, James Bridle. Um, he is a a thinker and and a lecturer uh, and a writer. Um, he had a very um, uh, um, uh, important uh, Tumblr blog back when Tumblr was important. Uh, he's moved, he moved excitedly from this idea, uh, what, he, what he called the new aesthetic. Uh, and it was about um, finding the imprint of the digital world expanding into, into real life, into the real world. Uh, but he's since in the past uh, uh, five or six years slid into this idea of, of the morass of, of, the, of the new dark age. Uh, and he's talking about the possible hijacking of the culture by the digital realm, pushing society toward the frigidness of, of fundament, fundamentalism, division, fear, and anger. Um, the uh, the second one is a is a uh, it's a paper that um, I found uh, called "The Snapshot Culture: Photographic Experience in the post medium Age" by uh, Adorano Eloye and Francesco uh, Parisi. Um, it's, it's just an incredible uh, paper, sort of documenting what uh, what it means to to, to live um, photographically in, in a digital realm. Uh, the, the third paper is by uh, Artie Vierdekant. Uh, it's called the uh, image object the image object post internet, and just basically describes what uh, what living in a in a in a post internet or 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 in an in after internet age. Um, so uh, that's, uh, that's all I got for y'all. And uh, now we get to uh, be blown away by, uh, by Bridges pictures. Thank you so much, Preston. That was awesome. I'm, I just posted on Instagram that I'm feeling very inspired by what you wrote, or not what you wrote, but what you had just said. Um, I love it. Thanks, Taylor. So great job and no worries about the technical difficulties. Yeah, I can, uh, I can, um, I can edit that out or provide um, funny commentary during it when right. I do post uh, edit. <laughs> Absolutely, the funny commentary. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Bridget, what do you think? Are you ready? Just make sure to unmute yourself. That would help. So let me know when you guys can see it. We're good. You're good? Yep. Okay, so thank you, Heather, Habib, Michael, JKC. Thank you, everybody, for having me. Um, Third Thursdays are awesome. Preston, sorry about your computer, but I love your work. I love what you wrote. Um, I do want to give a few disclaimers before I start. Um, as I go through this work, I just want everybody to know that I've spent many years in therapy. Um, I'm still in therapy. I work with lots of medical professionals to handle my mental and physical health. I am not a mental health professional. Um, nothing I do is meant to replace therapy or treatment in any way. Secondly, none of the people I've ever photographed have ever been patients of mine or have any connection to me through my role as a nurse. Lastly, this presentation does contain nudity and trauma stories. It's not meant to be triggering, um, rather an honest look at people. I don't want to reduce myself or anybody else down to the worst parts of our past, but I have found a lot of power and liberation in being forthright about what I've been through. Um, the women I've worked with feel similarly, and everybody in this presentation has given me explicit permission to share both their images and their words. So a little bit about me. Um, just going to go over this briefly because I won't return to it. Um, I started my photography journey 17 years ago. I graduated with a BA in photography in 2007. Um, I've gathered a really interesting collection of portraits throughout the years. Um, my other longest term project other than this is about animal rights in zoos, which I'm also very passionate about. About 10 years ago, I went back to school to become a nurse. Uh, my career transition was definitely bizarre. I spent seven years as a surgical nurse and now work in oncology. In 2017, I dropped down to part-time so I could grow my family photography business. Now I juggle both careers in addition to my fine art projects. Um, this talk is gonna be pretty formal. Um, I am reading it. Uh, I was originally supposed to give this as nursing lectures in 2020, 
but then COVID happened. Um, the bottom right picture is actually what I used to introduce uh, this project to the nursing community. It was a poster presentation that I presented three times. So I wanna take a few moments and dive right into my own past. Uh, it's heavy, but it's important, especially because I'm here discussing the harder parts of life. I've gone through too many traumas to mention, big T's, little T's. Um, uh, by the time I went to college, I'd already been through my fair share of challenges, the most disruptive of which was being repeatedly sexually abused by my older brother when I was around 10 to 11 years old. During my freshman year of college, a close friend gifted me my first proper camera, a Pentax K1000. Uh, this is the first roll of film I shot on it. You can see it didn't take me long to start documenting my body. Exploring trauma through art is not a new concept, but it's usually linked to photojournalism. To me, I was always eager for photojournalism of the self. Um, that camera quickly became how I processed everything, offering an endless well of support and reflection. This was me at 19 years old. I was not in my body, nor did I want to be. My self-portrait started out as a blunt, cathartic way to capture pain there were no words for. The year that these photos were taken, that same close friend who gifted me the camera started dating that same brother who sexually abused me. She knew about what he did to me before they met. In an effort to explain my upset about their relationship, I finally disclosed the abuse to my parents. Nothing really changed. They eventually got married. Now they have two daughters. I eventually disclosed the abuse to my entire family. Nothing has really changed since then either. All of them continue to welcome him and his family with open arms, and I can count on one hand the number of people in my family who stood firmly by me. My father hasn't spoken to me in 15 years since they got married because he is convinced that I made it up. My photography was very much born from and continually parallel to my own healing. In front of, whoop, it's not letting me go forward. Oh, there we go. Okay. Um, in front of my camera was where I became acquainted with my body in many ways. It's how I unlearned all the awful things people said and did to my body. How I honored all the shame, fear, anger, attention seeking, rebuilding and triumph. It was where I found inner power and meaning where I learned to love myself. But eventually my body took everything I had been through and transformed it into vague chronic physical ailments, which is super common among childhood trauma survivors. Once multiple illnesses had manifested, I finally truly began the slow process of learning how to care for myself. Even still, it remains an ongoing journey to feel comfortable and truly believe that I deserve safety, peace, and joy. My healing, like many others, will be a lifelong journey, but I'm proud to still be here for it. This is a more recent self-portrait from 2019, roughly 15 years after the first one that I showed you. Words often fall short in explaining the girl that I was versus the woman that I've become, but my portraits are a visual anthology of my transformation. I trust the story they tell. After finding power in revealing myself through portraiture early on, I wanted to look at how trauma was held by other people. I gravitated towards the survivors I knew those who were either literally or figuratively scarred. Initially, it began with me wanting to feel less alone in the hardest parts of my life. This was a piece for my first cohesive project aptly entitled Body Maps. It was an on the nose visual interpretation of five people's journey with trauma, literally having them stripped down in front of the camera to reveal the marks left behind. I curated the photos in forensic type files with their demographic information and trauma history. Sadly, two of the people involved with this project became really big parts of my own trauma, so their photos are gone. I went on to continue my work with people and their bodies throughout college. Most of it is on film, so I don't have much to show. Eventually, this work slowed down amongst my career change. In 2010, though, right before nursing school, I spent half a year at an ashram in Pennsylvania. I photographed a lot of people there, but two women in particular helped rekindle my love for photographing women's stories through their bodies. Victoria had been in a terrible drunk driving accident and suffered severe burns on her arms. She was incredibly open about her past and I was drawn to her profound self-awareness and positivity. I wanted her portraits to be unassuming, leaving nothing hidden. 
Suzanne's body also had a story to tell, though hers came in the form of severe scoliosis, specifically a 43 degree curve in her thoracic spine. She spent years listening to people marvel at her back, but was never able to see what was so astonishing. So we did nude asana portraits. She studied her images as a way to process and embrace her contours. She described that she could feel where she felt what was going on in her body. I also took very plain direct shots of her body to match up with her x-rays so she could see the translation of bone structure into musculature. Integrating the physicality of illness and injury into someone's self-perception this way offers a positive context where they can explore and maybe view themselves in a new light. Last year, 10 years after our session, Suzanne told me that she only did this session because I made it safe to be vulnerable. I have to say I've had the honor of working with women who have endured all kinds of trauma, cancer, rape, eating disorders, self-harm, physical injury, postpartum depression, or the traumatic loss of either a child, parent, or sibling. Their histories have all been so different, but the one common thread is that vulnerability is power. This has been my longest and fiercest held belief. I spent the majority of my life carrying around a terrible burden, one that I still struggle to put down some days. Most of us are carrying around unseen weights, but we don't have to hide them or hide from them. We have the option to be resolute in our weaknesses. It wasn't until years after this session with Suzanne that the next significant development of this work occurred. I have a good friend named Ani, whom I met in nursing school. Her mother, Marianne, had been battling cancer for several years. When the family could tell that the end was approaching, they asked me to come take their last set of family portraits together. Of course I did. A little, a little over a month after this photo was taken, Marianne passed away peacefully at home. A few, late, a few years later in 2018, while I was in a photography workshop that pushed photographers to get to the heart of our art, I asked Ani to do a session alone. It was the dead of winter, so we picked her out a warm outfit, but it was the jewelry that really did it. She wore a beautiful ring and necklace set given to her by her mother. We set out in a field to capture her portraits, some quiet, some melancholy, some longing, some happy. It had been cloudy the entire day, but as we were traipsing around, the clouds opened up to the most beautiful sunshine and we knew her mom was with us. This was the beginning of the female empowerment sessions as I currently offer them. These sessions are meant to assist women in creatively exploring and processing really difficult subjects. The goal is to reveal and celebrate who she is, capturing her vulnerability as much as her strength, because those two things are not mutually exclusive, they are married to each other. Abby has an extensive medical history. In addition to multiple invisible illnesses, she survived colon cancer in her early 20s. She wanted to outwardly convey that I'm not afraid of shit, literally and figuratively. I'm not scared anymore of the little things. People shouldn't be either. Shit happens. You can either have a tantrum while picking it up and start throwing it all over, or you can learn to control it and use it for good for yourself and for everybody else. She feels that by encouraging others and helping them, it, it brings encouragement and purpose to her story and helps her heal as well. While some people may argue that photos are inconsequential, I truly think that photography offers the ability to choose a new narrative or rather express an old narrative in a different, more empowering way. Kim was diagnosed with stage four colon cancer in 2015 at 29 years old after giving birth to her daughter, Ellie, a couple months prior. She was told after her diagnosis that she had months to live. That was followed by many, many surgeries and rounds of chemo. She originally found me in 2018 through the Magic Hour Foundation, an organization I volunteer for that offers free photo sessions to cancer patients and survivors. But we hit it off really well and we wound up becoming friends. When I asked her to describe why she wanted to spend her precious time and energy doing her session, this is what she wrote. Securing beautiful images amidst the most difficult of times was cathartic. Although I no longer feel like myself, I still wanted to capture the true essence of who I am. And that encompasses how I look at my daughter as her mother. I no longer wanted to wait until I'm fitter, have more hair back, can get my skin under control. This is how she sees me for real and how I hope to live on in her memories. We will always remember our magical experience exploring the gardens with all our, our pal Bridget. Most of the photos we have together are selfies, staged and posed. Through her photography, 
you were able to envelop the essence of our relationship, the love, the warmth, all of the feelings. We have the photos all over our house and they bring us such peace and comfort during the hardest of days. Our lives were made forever complicated by stage four colon cancer. It's not fair, it's ugly, and it's robbed us of so much, but not the love and bond we have for each other. That only grows stronger. I want Ellie to remember to persevere and to thrive. On chemo and recovering from surgery while dealing with other hugely problematic emotional issues, get outside yourself, throw on your pretty dress, and go for a frolic with your favorite person and remember the beauty the world still holds. I am planning on hopefully doing my second session with Kim and Ellie this spring because she is still here and she is still fighting six years later. Allie was sexually abused when she was 13 by someone she thought was a friend. She said dealing with the aftermath of the assault led to years of depression, anxiety, and body image issues where I would use my sexuality to control a situation, trying to take back the choice that was taken from me. She wanted to do this session because she thinks this work brings such a powerful essence to light, showcasing the ability to take back a sense of security and power. With her session, she said she wanted to gain a sense of pride, being able to walk tall and say, I am more than what happened to me. She told me I have succeeded not because of what happened to me, but in spite of it. I want my images to say that I am powerful, I am proud, and I am a fighter, but also that I am still feminine. The physicality of being photographed is very much worth discussing. I have extensive experience as a photographer, but I have also been on the other end, both clothed and nude, sitting for other photographers. And that component of being witnessed is not always easy, but it can be profound, even if you're just by yourself. This pointedness of being in front of the lens is where I think collaborations transcend taking pictures. These women give me permission to show them themselves in a way they may, might not otherwise see. When such a sharp focus is on you and your body, it has the potential to become uncomfortable if handled poorly. But when handled well, it builds trust and moves into a safe space where the person being photographed feels free to express themselves. Perhaps for the first time, they're getting comfortable feeling beautiful or strong in front of a camera. Maybe it's the first time they're putting their newly changed bodies out there. Hell, for some of these women, it's the first time they've told anybody their story. Whatever their unraveling might be, this session is a haven where they get to reveal what they want and that's meaningful. Kimberly battled postpartum depression for years. She wanted to do an empowerment session because she said she considers herself a warrior woman after finding the immeasurable amount of strength it took to get through PPD. A fair amount of time had passed since our session before she finally shared her images on social media. It was alongside a powerful post where she boldly admitted for the first time that at one point she battled suicidal thoughts and her depression almost took her life. This is the beauty of the space photography creates. No one will ever see the photographs or know the story behind them unless you intentionally let them. You can be naked or bare your soul, but the process is protected by a moat of safety where opinions and criticism cannot enter. After I deliver each woman's gallery, they're free to examine the images in the comfort and privacy of their own space and time. There are thousands of images of myself and other women I've worked with that have never seen the light of day. Once I archive an entire session because it didn't sit right with the woman. This privacy allows for us to do deeper work, knowing each session has a tight degree of control subject to the woman's choice of disclosure. This is a very important point for trauma survivors as all traumas involve to some degree a loss of control. Kimberly is now a long time maternal mental health advocate. Recently, she added a photography to her arsenal and her moods of motherhood project on Instagram is raising awareness and bringing some much needed honest conversations about motherhood to the table. Danielle's brother served two tours in Iraq and graduated from nursing school with honors when he got home. She wrote, the effects of PTSD were impossible for him to beat. He had used his life to save other people, but he could not save his own. As his big sister, I felt responsible for his death. For months, I beat myself up. For all the things I could have said and should have done, I became paralyzed, lived in a daze, believed that stress had dismantled my insides. I went for a routine checkup and left with the news that my uterus has been riddled with fibroids and my ovaries with cysts. I had just turned 40. I already had three kids, but I wasn't sure I was done having children. Being a mother, especially a single one, hasn't been easy, but having to make that final of a decision 
at a time when I was still grieving was nearly impossible. In just a matter of months, I had lost my baby brother and my ability to have any more children. I lived in darkness for longer than I'd like to remember. But through it all, I was somehow able to hold on to my blessings and find gratitude in what miracles I had left. On the day of the, our shoot, we chased the sunshine on a near winter's day, surrounded by the absolute magic of the universe, the calm of the sea, and the stinging bitterness of being alive. The shoot was not simply a symbolic form of empowerment. It was a reminder that we can always find light even, of our, even in our darkest hours, and that life is too short not to celebrate the sheer beauty of being free. Kate was diagnosed with breast cancer when she was 30 years old after finding a lump while she was breastfeeding her baby boy. She underwent a double mastectomy and was diagnosed with leaf Fermini syndrome, which causes multiple cancers. Not long after her diagnosis, she found out that her older son had the same genetic disorder and will require lifelong monitoring. She said after her first session, you made us feel so special and normal when most people just looked at us sad. You captured such special pictures and in a time in our lives when it could have went either way, good or bad. Those could have been our last pictures together. I thought about that so many times. My friend died during her chemo treatments and the last picture she has with her family are her cancer ones. I am thankful because if these were my last pictures, my family would always know that we loved each other so much. Kate's been very upfront about the details of her journey saying, I try to be transparent with people with all of this, because if I can help one person with their journey, then it was all worth it. Here's a shot from their second session in January, 2020 to celebrate her first year of being cancer free. During our first session, she still had her breast expanders in and was in the middle of surgeries. Eventually she got her final implants and her nipple tattoos. She was so excited about her new body. She asked if I do some solo shots. She was absolutely radiant. Creating pictures like this is a chance to honor what happened without narrowly defining the person as a victim. We get to see a bit of what they went through while at the same time seeing how much more they are than just that one piece of their journey. This project started as me transforming my traumas into fortitude, but continued with me be, being in awe of how other people do the same. It's evolved to be this beautiful intersection of vulnerability, courage, empowerment, and awareness. Being open about where we've been and where we are at is truly how I think we'll all find our collective strength. Sharing portraits accompanied by stories personalizes what is often presented statistically. It destigmatizes trauma in a way that theoretical discussion can't and continues an ongoing dialogue around challenging topics. Plus, for those balance, battling similar issues, these offages, images offer camaraderie, inspiration, and hope. Seeing a cancer survivor's new breasts or a beautiful woman rocking her ostomy, or someone holding space for their depression can and does change people's perspectives. It offers a new spectrum of coping around things that people may not know how to handle at first. Through bearing witness, we can all help change how trauma is acknowledged and held. I think the, the process of using creative outlets to help symbolize, actualize, and nurture healing is something that will continue to gain traction in the upcoming years especially as a culture of disclosure thankfully continues to grow. Personally, I hope people witness stories like mine and the women that I've worked with and realize that shame and self-hatred or failure are not inevitabilities They're, that are really difficult past doesn't preclude you from having a really fulfilling, joyous future. Thank you so much for listening to me. Bridget, that was incredible. Wow, amazing job. Thank you for sharing with us. Speechless. Amazing, amazing, amazing work. You never oh, fail. <laughs> yeah. You amaze me. So we have um, seven minutes left today where we'll be doing um, Q&A and Michael um, will be walking us through that. So if anyone has any questions to ask either Preston or Bridget individually, or maybe a question to both artists, um, you can type it right into the chat box. Yeah, mostly it was just compliments. So not a, not a lot of questions today. 
I did see earlier up, Bridget asked um, a question of Preston. Uh, yes, where'd that go? I can ask it again. Yes, <laughs> yes you know what? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just yeah. Ask that it. might be easier, what? right? right. Let me spend five someplace. minutes searching for it. Hang on. <laughs> so I said, I said some of the shots, some of your shots were so tender and others were screenshots. And I was wondering how you felt like about the deluge of images and how it affects like the specialness of like images as a whole. Yeah, well, I mean, it's it's a sticky wicket, right? I mean, it's it's you know, you know, um, it depends where it's seen, right? I mean, something like this, I mean, everything becomes kind of kind of equal. So the screenshots and the tender shots are kind of you know on the same plane in a way, right? Um, if it were just a tender shots that you saw, then there would be one thing. If they're just a screenshot, there'd be another. But like, I mean, it, it's, it's, they're all pictures, right? They're all pictures in the end. Right. Right. So, you know, we take them as, as we take them. You know, I mean, if it, if it was on Instagram, it would be a different thing, right? Like there's, right. there's different in, instantations of, of, of where, of where pictures get to be and where they get to live. So, you know, for this thing, those the screenshots and and the pictures of my mom got to live in the same place right I don't does know that make them less that. special to you uh no i mean it's like I, I special is an interesting question i mean i'm not i'm not sure i'm not sure how to process that okay i mean uh, like because all my images are like holy little like i right. they're they're like you know what i mean so like they're very yeah. formal yeah and it's like mixing yeah, well, them. I just wonder, like, not that it waters them down, but like the juxtaposition, it does, they are all images. Right. Right. And and it's it's you know, it's you know, Preston Robert, uh Rob, hey Rob, Spar asked the question, the almost a similar question, but in a in a more specific way, are they equal in viewing or equal in making? That's, uh, a, equal, that's equal, another way yeah, to think yeah. about it. <laughs> me and me and me and Rob have have had many conversations about this. Um it's it's equal in viewing. I mean, the making is, is a whole other thing because, I mean, there is, you know, you, you make decisions what you photograph and what you show and what you edit, and, you know, but like when you're viewing, it, it, it all comes down to where, to what and where you're viewing it, right? I mean, it's, it's you know, it's, 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 it's that instantation compared to another. So it's, you know, they get to live where they live or not, or in, or in multiple places. I mean, that's, that's kind of the beauty of, of like photography now, right? It gets, it gets, you know, you know, Bridget, I mean, your images get to live with the people that you photograph, but they also get to live here in the, in, the, in this presentation. So they, you know, it's, it's all one big, beautiful jumble, you know, in, 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 and it doesn't mean that one's more special. I mean, if you get back to the special thing, it doesn't mean that one's more special than the other. It's just, you know, one, one can affect you in one place and also affect you in another. Right. And actually, along those lines, Bridget, your your work in some ways has two different audiences. There's the work that it's specifically made for. Uh, mm -hmm. Actually, three. There's the there, mm -hmm. uh, and your this is the work that you you made to present for the uh, the nursing staff, right, or our nursing conference, right. And then there's the work which has a, a, a you know, crafted much more in a in a, a way for you know a fine art presentation like this, right. So the nursing, um, it was all the same work. I've been doing this project for probably 16 or 17 years. A nurse found out about it and they wanted me to present it, but it was never for nurses. However, it was originally supposed to be given with the tonality that our patients are not checklists, that there is a holistic side of people. And when I make this work, it is, it is both for the person I'm making it for and then for everybody else who views it with of course the person I'm making it for trumping everything with their permission. And if they don't want me to share it, I don't share it. But the people that see it, there is that dual audience. And that's why I think it's so important. And then medical professionals, once they saw it, not only did it touch them personally, but then they think like I was an operating room nurse for seven years. I have never seen finished breasts after reconstruction. I've never seen an ostomy years later. And I've never seen what it's like living with those every day. And it's helpful to, to have that added layer of your patients. So it definitely is like multimodal and it heals me and it heals the women that do it. And 
there's a lot of awareness around it. A lot of the women I've worked with have used the images for awareness around whatever trauma it is that they sustained. I like your phrase multimodal. I mean, that's, that's, that's like, that's the, <laughs> God, you're off spree. Multimodal. <laughs> No, but it's yeah. I mean, it's 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 what it's what's wonderful about this era of of image making, right? I mean, it gets to exist in so many different planes, right? So many different places. Yep, and it can live a long time. A lot of these sessions were years ago. I mean, in the one session from 2010, that woman, you know, still has scoliosis. She still looks at the pictures. We still talked about this presentation today. Like it lives on. That's what I love about it. And then people can find it as they go. So I'll, I'll save the chat and make sure you get all the, the nice uh, compliments. We're, we're coming up on uh, eight o'clock. Um, and so Heather and Habib, uh, if you want to close us out. And then, of course, um, uh, we have our, our next third Thursday coming up on April 15th. But I'm getting ahead of myself. We really want to thank <laughs> Bridget and Preston uh, for sharing their work, uh, their incredible work. Uh, and I'll let Heather and Habib close us out. Uh, Heather, you want to go first? Or? Sure. I just want to send like sincere thank you um, to both of you. I really enjoyed and loved both of your presentations. I was feeling so inspired by both of them and especially empowered um, by Bridget's. So you both gave me a lot to think about uh, and two totally different realms. So um, I appreciate that. Um, and just thank you endlessly for um, just for coming tonight and being a part of this event. We really appreciate you. Thank you. Can you guys hear me? And thanks to everybody for coming. Yes, thank you. For virtually coming. Can you guys hear me? Yes. See, yep. Can you hear me? <laughs> yeah, it was amazing. And uh, Bridget, there were there were definitely moments uh, where we I think we were all uh, holding on. That was a, an amazing. Um, all right. Well, thank you, everyone. If um, uh, anybody wants to hang out and chat for a while, uh, we can do some of that if you uh, if you need to go and thank you for coming and we'll see you next month.